Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Alhamdulillah kita akan segera memulai diskurs dari Syekh Ibrahim Kasiruni untuk undangan yang disampaikan oleh pengajian ibu-ibu sekalian yang dimulakan Allah sedikit introduksi yang bisa saya sampaikan adalah bahwa Syekh Ibrahim Kasiruni ini lahir di Najaf 2 Juli 1949 beliau adalah Iranian origin berasal dari keluarga Iran yang berpindah ke Irak kemudian menamatkan pelajaran teologi dan Islamic Studies di Najaf dan Tehran serta Qom. Beliau pernah belajar di bawah Ayatullah Muhammad Bakir Sadr, kemudian Martir Murtada Mutahari dan Imam Humaini. Kemudian beliau juga melanjutkan pendidikan umum, beliau tamat dari Imperial College di London pada bidang Bachelor Engineering di Mining Petroleum. Jadi dia ini sarjana teknik pertambangan. Dan kemudian beliau pernah bekerja sebagai engineer juga. dan kemudian kembali ke Imperial College untuk menamatkan Magister Manajemen jadi dia mempunyai dua field pengetahuan sebagai teologian dan belajar Islamic Studies juga belajar ilmu umum aktivitas beliau dengan Islamic Center England di bawah Ayatullah Mohsen Araki itu yang banyak sekali melakukan program-program yang aktif penyebaran Islam untuk masyarakat non muslim di England dalam berbagai macam bahasa dan beliau sendiri juga menguasai empat bahasa jadi Arab, Persian, Inggris dan French jadi diskusi mungkin bisa dalam berbagai bahasa beliau spesialis pada masalah ideologi Islam, sosiologi, human right, masalah hak-hak wanita dan banyak hal termasuk filsafat hanya kali ini beliau diminta berbicara masalah Irfan nah untuk itu Beliau punya waktu sampai setengah empat mungkin atau lebih Karena pukul lima mungkin harus ada di airport Sehingga kita persilahkan beliau untuk memulainya Oh please Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi ya rabbil alamin Bari'il khala'iqi ajma'in Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Wa habiba kulubina abil qasim al mustafa muhammad اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين ولا وصحبه المنتجبين سيسترز السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته before i start i would like to take this opportunity and express my own gratitude for the invitation at least as far as my own experience is concerned It is unparalleled to be invited to a meeting with a group of dedicated sisters that I have heard so much about. And as I was explaining to Brother Hadi and my learned sister before, last night and this morning, the number of times that I have seen your picture in the Tazkiyah Center, it's as if I have known the sisters for many years. I humbly ask the Almighty Allah for your success and for your future happiness. Pertama-tama beliau mengucapkan salam dan terima kasih sangat kepada pengajian ibu-ibu yang dimuliakan Allah atas undangannya. Dan beliau menyatakan tidak pernah melihat sekelompok wanita yang berdedikasi sekali dalam Islam dan melakukan kegiatan yang banyak. Yang menurut beliau unparalel. Beliau tadi banyak melihat gambar-gambar di Tazkiyah karena menginap di Tazkiyah dan melihat gambar-gambar foto ibu semua sehingga dia seakan-akan telah mengenali ibu-ibu dari tahun-tahun sudah beberapa tahun mengenal ini. I have I'm going to take approximately 35 to 40 minutes of your time and share a few ideas and then I hope the sisters would enlighten me with their experience. The topic which I have been asked to look at today is how, what is the meaning of Irfan or in some definition Tasawwuf and how do we become a true Arif or a true Mutasawwuf. The issue of Irfan in its theor- theoretical or practical concept it's not something that one can deal with in uh, such a short space of time. I think only the historical development would take 
probably many lectures for one to discuss and debate the history of Irfan and Tasawwuf from its inception up to today. There are a number of views when you look at the historical development or the foundation of Irfan. There are those who claim Irfan and Tasawwuf was primarily nothing to do with Islam. It developed within the Persian culture, within the Roman culture, or within the Indian culture, or the Greek culture, in opposition to Islam. Otherwise, Islam is incapable of bringing out such a minute, eloquent concept of inner development. That's one view. There is, on the other hand, another view that no, the Arfan or Tasawwuf developed within Islam. It did not come from outside. But it was in an opposition to what we call the tyrannical rules of Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas and so on. And there is another view that most scholars today would follow that no, the source of true Irfan and Tasawwuf comes from the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. It, what it needs is a correct understanding of these verses and these traditions. Otherwise, the concepts are not foreign. They have not come from somewhere else. Uliya menyatakan bahwa topik yang akan disampaikan adalah tentang Irfan itu sendiri dan bagaimana menjadi seorang Arif yang sebenarnya. Beliau akan mengupas dalam 30 menit dan mungkin sisanya diskusi. Menurut beliau untuk membicarakan Irfan secara teoritis dan praktis ini akan memakan waktu yang sangat panjang sehingga tidak mungkin dibicarakan dalam waktu singkat sehingga akan beliau akan melihat beberapa histori perkembangan Irfan dan tasawuf serta mungkin nanti bagaimana sebenarnya kita bisa mencapai kearifan dalam tips-tips yang mungkin bermanfaat. Jadi ada beberapa teori yang beliau sampaikan bahwa ada pendapat bahwa Irfan dan Tasawuf itu tidak ada hubungannya sama sekali dengan Islam. Itu merupakan perkembangan yang terjadi di Iran, India, Yunani, dan Roman. Yang kedua ada teori bahwa Islam sendiri mampu menghasilkan suatu pemikiran yang lebih melihat aspek mendalam spiritual. Yang ketiga Irfan datang dari Islam, tetapi itu sebagai oposisi dari kezaliman Bani Umayyah dan Abbasid dan lain-lain. Yang keempat bahwa Irfan itu sebenarnya bersumber dari Quran dan Sunnah Nabi Shallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sehingga perlu kita lihat konsepsi yang benar tentang ini sehingga kita bisa berbicak. As far as uh, historical development and the shape or the color or the image of Irfan and Tasawwuf over the history one can see different variations in time. Definitely up to the 10th century, which is about 400 years ago, both its practical and theoretical concepts were combined together by a number of orafa. That is, Orafa not only believed in the theoretical concept, but practically lived like Arif, where the simplicity of their life, the humility, the humbleness, the way they spend their life dealing with other people and solving other people's problem was quite clear. However, after the 10th century, a marked distinction appeared between what we call theoretical concept, the theory of Irfan, and practical Irfan, where a number of scholars became theoretician in Irfan that they were not Arif themselves. And at the same time, a number of Arifs lived in a practical sense, but they never called themselves Mutasawwaf or Arif. So the 10th century marks the, the historical change from one stage of Irfan to another, where there is a division between practice and theory. And if you look at uh, the number of Orafa and Mutasawwafin that lived before the 10th century and compare them to the life of those who lived after, you see a marked di distinction. 
that those who came after, some of them concentrated on issues that were totally superficial, not part of the true understanding of Arfan, and they created a special life for themselves, and particularly with the rejection of Sharia. This uh, created a marked distinction between those who came after and those who came before. Although you see concepts of Sharia, Tariqa and Haqiqa being discussed in the philosophy in the Urafa before 10th century, but nobody says that Sharia has to be rejected. But on the contrary, they all agree that Sharia is the first step towards soul purification. It's the methodology, the way you apply the Sharia in your life, not rejection of the Sharia. While today we come across a number of so-called mutasawwafin that reject even validity of Sharia as such. Beliau melihat dari perkembangan sejarah dari Irfan itu sendiri. Jadi kalau kita lihat sebelum abad ke-10 Hijriah, kira-kira 400 tahun yang lalu, semua ulama atau urafa yang spesialis pada Irfan, mereka menguasai baik secara teori maupun praktis. Jadi mereka itu secara teori mendalam dan dalam praktis sehari-hari pun mereka dalam adab dan akhlak mereka baik dalam kehidupan sehari-hariannya. Jadi di situ tidak ada pemisahan antara yang teori maupun yang praktis sampai abad ke-10 Hijriah. Tapi mulai abad ke-10 Hijriah terjadi suatu perubahan yang cukup besar. Sebagian ulama yang mengaku ahli Irfan, mereka lebih sering berdiskusi pada masalah uh, teori dan mereka sendiri tidak bisa disebut sebagai arif karena tidak dalam praktisnya mereka berbeda dan ini superficial namun sebagian lagi banyak yang urafa tetap arif dalam kesehariannya namun tidak uh, membuka diri dalam teori kemudian hal yang lebih ekstrim terjadi bahwa sebagian mereka yang hanya berdebat pada masalah superficial atau teori ini menolak syariah jadi menganggap tidak perlu lagi syariah Jadi konsep syariat, tarekat, dan hakikat ini kan kita semua mengetahuinya. Dan menurut beliau, langkah pertama untuk menjadi true arif itu adalah dengan melakukan syariat. Sehingga sebagian pendapat mereka bahwa syariat itu tidak perlu, itu sangat bertolak belakang dengan pendapat para ulama maupun arif sebelumnya. Dan para urafa sebelumnya pun tidak pernah mengatakan bahwa syariat itu harus ditolak untuk menjadi arif. Justru dalam Islam, itu merupakan langkah pertama di mana kita mengikuti aturan itu. Arfan, in, which, is, which has an Arabic root, if we were to look at the literal meaning, means understanding in Arabic, comprehension, perception, these are the general meaning of the word itself. But when we use it within an Islamic context, we do not mean the literal Arabic meaning. Here, Arfan becomes a discipline, a science, by which man achieves that ultimate level that the Almighty Allah has delegated to man to achieve. This we see in the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, that inni ja'alun fil ardi khalifa. I am creating a vicegerent on earth, that man becomes khalifa to Allah. Now, how does man become Khalifatullah is the point of discussion and debate. There are those who claim the only way possible for one to become, to reach that ultimate and optimum point is to leave human race and go and find a cave, uh, some kind of a corner, quiet corner, and simply pray from the morning till evening. There are those who claim that no, you don't even need to pray. You can follow certain rituals of sitting down together and occasional turning and saying dhikr and that's it. That would take you up. There are alternative views that one can call it the dynamic concept of Irfan is that you cannot turn your back to human beings, to fellow members of your own society, and develop. Because your development as a social animal is within the group. It's very easy when there is no temptation. 
in a quiet corner when there is no, nothing to distract you to say that I have reached the optimum point. If you really can withhold yourself when there is temptation, then you have done something. If you look at the number of books that we have on Arfan, they all mention the story of two brothers. One who went outside the city and found, found a cave and simply prayed in the, from the morning till late at night for 70 years. And he reached a point where he could touch metal and actually soften them with his hand. He came back to the city one day after 70 years to see his brother. His brother was a jeweler who dealt with gold. But this man has, had lived within the city and had attained that power where he actually melted the gold with his hand and shaped it into different jewelries. So the brother enters the shop of his brother. The younger brother says, could you wait here and look after the shop for me to go and finish some business and come back? The younger one leaves, the elder one who never was used to the life of the city sits in the shop. Within a few minutes, a young lady, very attractive, comes into the shop and lifts her skirt up that I want something for my neck, for my leg. I want the jewelry for my leg. Seventy years he has not seen the shape of a woman. Lost everything in one minute. And he kept on touching the metal, nothing happens. The brother came back, he said, brother, when there is no temptation, it is very easy to call yourself an Arif. The difficulty is to call yourself an Arif when there are temptations around. If you can do this, then you are a true believer. Ya, yeah, beliau menunjukkan cerita yang sangat menarik. Irfan secara definisi dalam bahasa Arab itu adalah suatu pengertian, comprehension, dan hal lain. Tapi dari sisi pandang Islam, Irfan adalah suatu sains di dalam Islamic studies. Untuk mencapai tujuan akhir atau level yang tertinggi yang bisa dicapai manusia Nah ini dengan sayan Irfan itu Yaitu dalam Quran dikatakan bahwa Allah menciptakan kita menjadi kalifatullah fil art Sebagai kalifat Allah, representatif Allah Sebagai bayangan Allah atau apa, wakil-wakil Allah di muka bumi Nah ini hanya bisa dicapai kalau kita mengetahui sayannya dan melakukannya Ada beberapa pendapat tentang bagaimana mencapai ultimate goal ini Yaitu Tipe pertama adalah dengan mengisolasi, dengan uslah, dan mengasingkan diri dari e, kehidupan duniawi. Di sini tidak ada tantangan, sehingga ini lebih e, statis. Yang kedua, dengan mengikuti suatu tarekat atau e, ritual tertentu yang terus-menerus, dan dikatakan hanya dengan itu kita akan mencapainya. Yang ketiga, yang beliau memandang ini lebih benar adalah dinamik irfan, di mana kita hidup dalam masyarakat, mengembangkan masyarakat, menuju ultimate goal itu dengan kita sendiri ikut terlibat kan di situ banyak tantangannya dan ini akan sangat sulit ada suatu cerita di mana dua orang e, saudara yang satu mengambil cara isolasi dia 70 tahun bersikir dan seterusnya sampai dengan mencapai tingkatan beliau orang ini mampu melunakan besi dengan sentuhan tangannya saudara mudanya dia tinggal di kota sebagai pedagang perhiasan dan dia melakukan tetap ritual dan mendekatkan diri kepada Allah sehingga dia pun mampu melunakan emas dan mengubah menjadi perhiasan-perhiasan suatu hari saudara tuanya datang dan datang ke kiosnya dan yang muda ini meninggalkannya nah kemudian seorang wanita datang ke kios perhiasan emas itu dan dia ingin perhiasan untuk dikalungkan di lehernya sehingga ketika dia membuka scarfnya maka saudara tua ini yang sudah 70 tahun melakukan riadoh terus menerus dan tidak pernah melihat Keindahan wanita dia lupa segalanya Sehingga ketika saudara mudanya datang Dia mengatakan bahwa Untuk menjadi arif tanpa tantangan itu sangat mudah Tapi ketika menghadapi tantangan inilah Yang sangat tidak mudah Generally speaking When we look at the Holy Quran We come across a number of verses That rejects that man being one dimensional Only physical Always this two-dimensional uh, existence of man or reality of man has been pointed out in a variety of verses from within the Holy Quran. Sometimes we see that ruh and madda being mentioned. 
spirit and physique. Sometimes dust and spirit are being related together. We created man from earth and then we blew the spirit into it. And a number of other verses that purely that they indicate man is Islam does not accept that man is made only from physique. The appearance alone is not the criteria for judging the quality of a person. Repeatedly we see that the uh, verses in the Holy Quran says that despite rejects the kuffar on the non-believers and equates them with worse than animal, although in appearance they have the biological appearance of a human. In whom kal an'am bal avallu sabila that they are uh, similar to the uh, to the animals or even sometimes worse. Uh, this concept indicates that this duality between the character or the true definition of human being is not the physical appearance. What happens inside is the framework for one to be called a human being and Khalifatullah or for one to be called as to reach Asfal as safalin or worse than animal. We see Khalaqna al Insan fi ahsana taqweem thumma ja'alnahu asfal as safalin This constant struggle between the inner and the outer uh, is there. Now how do we, well, despite the sharing of all this physical appearance, how are we supposed or what procedure should we follow to develop ourselves towards that ultimate Khalifatullah, the vicegerency, is an issue that primarily talked about in, in Arfan and Tasawwuf. That no matter what is the appearance, it's extra things that you have to do. By the way, I must point out here that dynamic arfan is about things that you do, not about things that you don't do. There is a difference between dynamic arfan and what I call static arfan. A static arfan simply tells you don't do anything. Dynamic arfan says you have to do something. There is a difference between these two, where your future lies in your own hand, or the future is simply controlled beyond your action and you don't need to do anything. Within the dynamic concept of Arfan, everything in all the departments that I will mention later, you have to do something. And this is the critical part where the sisters, the role that you have, in the formation of the new generation. This is why I said it's so unique to see so many sisters getting together with all the responsibilities that you have. That it is things that you should do to develop yourself, not things that you shouldn't do. Bisa melanjutkan bahwa dalam logika Al-Quran dikatakan Al-Quran menolak pandangan manusia sebagai satu dimensi saja. Tetapi adanya dua dimensi yang diminta terus dikembangkan dalam banyak ayat Al-Quran di Sitir adanya Allah menyediakan dalam ayat, banyak ayat tentang ruh dan jasmani fisik dan ruh atau dust and spirit dikatakan bagian itu menunjukkan adanya dua mencukupi untuk menilai manusia sehingga Allah menyatakan bahwa orang-orang kafir itu dikatakan seperti binatang dan kadang-kadang mereka ini bahkan lebih rendah dari binatang sehingga yang harus dikembangkan oleh manusia adalah inner capacity karakteristik apakah dia mencapai asfala safili ataukah dia turun rendah menjadi lebih rendah dari binatang nah di sini ada konsep struggle atau tarikan inner yaitu dari alam spirit yang menuju ke alam yang lebih tinggi dan tarikan dari alam fisik jadi selalu bertentangan dan inilah yang menjadi dinamis jadi dinamik irfan ini adalah bagaimana kita melakukan dan berpikir apa yang harus kita lakukan sedangkan statik irfan itu lebih mengarah kepada kita tidak usah melakukan nah beliau menyatakan bahwa inilah yang akan beliau bahas berikutnya bagaimana kita bisa melakukan hal itu terutama peranan para ibu-ibu dan wanita dimana pertemuan ini sangat unik karena begitu banyak ibu-ibu yang hadir untuk uh, melihat dimensi ini from an islamic uh, point of view Man, if we look at it from humanistic uh, or from human's angle, there are three major concepts. 
A balance between these three major concepts are the essence of Irfan or Tasawwur. Allah, Insan, and the world around. And if you look uh, in the Holy Quran, a number of prophetic traditions from Ahlul Bayt as well as uh, Grand uh, Arafa and Mutasawwafin, you see that they try to prescribe a method where there is a balance between concept of God, man's relation to God, man's relation to, uh, to the uh, world around it. World's relation to Allah and Allah's relation to man and the world. This circular dynamic motion is, becomes the essence of Irfan. For on a very briefly, in a purification and that enlightenment that we all search for cannot be achieved unless we look at this into break it down into different departments. First, our relationship with the world around us, particularly the materialistic world. Uh, traditions, verses indicate that unless we break away from materialistic desire and understand the correct notion of zuhd and piety, which again Quran defines and la tahzanu ala ma fatakum wa la tafrahu bima atakum. The notion of zuh means that you do not become regretful for what materialistic that you, materials that you have lost and you do not become elated with what you have gained. Totally indifferent. You accept the gain as Allah's mercy and again you accept the loss as Allah's test. This is the notion of zuh. When it comes, this is a dynamic concept, is not a passive one. That you become totally indifferent. If you look at Nahjul Balagha, for example, on a number of occasions we see Amir Mumin Ali ibn Abi Talib والسلام, the concept of zuh, he defines it into a dynamic concept. That you have to elevate yourself to the degree that materialistic life does not become the criteria by which you judge your happiness or sadness. That's number one. Yes, totally neutral, indifferent. When it comes to Sharia, again, this is the dynamic concept that it's not only the vajibat that you have to do, the obligatory. For a person who wants to attain that higher level, it's the mustahabbat that comes as well. Mustahabbat becomes as equal to obligatory. It's not only the prayer, the five times prayer. Mustahabbat and the recommend, recommended act become extremely important in soul purification. So forget about those who say Sharia does not have a role in Tariqah. Sharia has a foundation role. That's number two. Number three, that struggle from within. Do not allow constantly, be watchful. Do not allow your inner nafsul lawama to take over. Do not give in to the nafs, no matter how difficult it is. That struggle, you could resist. If you look at the verse, verses in the Holy Quran, why Prophet Yusuf reached that status that he reached? Because of one stance against his nafs. When Zulaikha wanted him, he said no for the fear, everything for the sake of Allah. And that resistance is part of your soul development. You cannot go up if you do not step on your ego. Number four dimension of this is helping the needy and the destitute within your society. Those of you who have gone through a books on Irfan, you see that as far, for example, the concept of journeys, uh, it's a clear-cut case that eventually, once we reach the higher level, the only way that we can be productive is when we come down and become humble within the society and start serving the society for the sake of Allah. And finally, as Assalamu alaikum sister. And finally, 
No journey would be possible without the help of guides. And guides are extremely important for those who intend to elevate themselves. And no better guides can be found than Ahlul Bayt Their example and uh, whatever they have left, because we cannot find anyone that gets as pure and as clean and as perfect as they are. No better guides you can find than those. So if you, if somebody tells you that you can achieve that soul purification and perfection without following Ahlul Bayt and without love for Ahlul Bayt, possible as the French say it, is not possible. Uh, th this is not possible because role models, particularly within Arfan, role models are extremely critical. You look at number of poets, poems that they have recited about Arfan constantly say, Oh teacher, get my hand and pass me through these jungles. Who better than these people who have gone through and by the explicit command of Allah have attained perfection to become our own leaders. Beliau menyatakan bahwa menurut pandangan Islam, kita harus melakukan keseimbangan antara dalam hubungan kita dengan antara kita dengan Allah dan dengan dunia di sekitar kita. Jadi ada tiga hal yaitu Allah, insan dan world around. Ini merupakan gerakan sirkular yang merupakan esens dari dinamik irfan. Dalam banyak ayat Al-Quran dikatakan bahwa kita hanya bisa mencapai kebebasan dan kita menaikkan level itu kalau kita mampu melepaskan diri dari tarikan material. Sehingga definisi suhud dan kesalehan dalam Al-Quran dikatakan suhud itu adalah tidak menyesal terhadap apa yang telah kehilangan dan tidak terlalu bergembira terhadap apa-apa yang kita peroleh karena bagi orang yang beriman dikatakan bahwa orang yang kita kalaupun kita kehilangan itu hanyalah tes dan kalau diperoleh itu hanyalah karena rahmat dari Allah ini merupakan pemahaman dinamis dari Irfan ada beberapa nasihat beliau untuk mencapai itu pertama bagaimana kita meningkatkan level kita sendiri hadapan Allah kesalehan apa namanya dalam Irfan itu adalah bersikap suhut itu tadi tidak menjadikan senang dengan apa yang diperoleh maupun susah dengan apa yang telah kehilangan dan ini dikatakan oleh Amirul Mukminin dalam kutbah-kutbah beliau di Nasir Balagoh pertama itu dari Amirul Mukminin yang kedua melakukan hal-hal yang mutasyahabat dan sunnah jadi dilakukan dalam sholat tidak hanya wajib tapi sholat-sholat sunnah dan hal-hal yang recommended kemudian yang ketiga adalah struggle dari within yaitu kita berusaha terus untuk menahan agar apapun nafsu itu tidak mengambil alih kita ini ceritakan pada kisah Yusuf dan Sulaiha bagaimana Yusuf itu mencapai kedudukan tinggi karena beliau alaihissalam mampu menahan hawa nafsunya sendiri sehingga kita tidak mengikuti ego kita sendiri itu poin yang ketiga dari pesan Amirul Mu'minin yang keempat dan ini sangat produktif ya adalah menolong orang-orang yang membutuhkan di masyarakat serta orang-orang miskin sebab ini merupakan aplikasi dari Irfan itu sendiri dengan memberikan dan apa serving atau melayani masyarakat karena Allah poin yang kelima adalah perlunya pembimbing perlunya seorang pembimbing yang terpercaya dan tidak ada pembimbing yang paling baik kecuali Ahlul Bait alaihissalam karena tidak ada yang mencapai level yang lebih tinggi dalam purification dan kesempurnaan dibanding mereka dan role atau peranan pembimbing yang benar ini sangat penting sebab so, dalam banyak puisi-puisi para urafa dikatakan wahai guru ulurkan tanganmu untuk membimbing kami gitu. and because I'm running out of time and I would like to allow uh, some times with the sister for the sisters to uh, discuss this further uh, I would like to wrap it up here and as I said it would take a long time to discuss this uh, I may if uh, the sisters wouldn't do not object to it I would leave my email uh, if you have access to emails then you can communicate through the emails and I'll be able to I'll do my best uh, to reply and respond uh, but my final advice as far as 
Arfan is to remind you of the five issues. First, Zuhd and proper understanding of Zuhd, which means piety and do not consider material life to be the criteria of uh, everything around you. That's number one. Extremely important not only to comply with the wajibat and the obligatory prayers, obligatory responsibilities, even the recommended act for those who would like to elevate themselves, particularly Salatul Layl, late night prayers, just before Adhan al-Subh, when everybody else is asleep. Uh, that there are a number of traditions that prayers in such time is extremely considered to be uh, uh, Allah responds to it very quickly and not only it it is responded very quickly it affects in the enlightenment and purification of soul that's number two number three never give in to your own desires always struggle no matter how difficult it is because that's if you consider yourself to be accountable and that on the day of judgment you will be asked you never know one stance could move you suddenly steps forward that years by ordinary struggle could not be possible. Number four, do not forget your fellow members of the community, the needy and the destitute. It's, there are a number of traditions from the Holy Prophet, Hadith Qudsi, that Allah says, I love my servants and I love uh, humans that I have created. If somebody loves me let, me, let them show affection towards what I have created. So your love for the Almighty Allah becomes relevant and transcends itself into human love. And finally, never give up for the love of Ahlul Bayt that you have gained. And I pray to the Almighty Allah humbly for your success and uh, future prosperity. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Ya, jadi beliau menutup pembicaraan kita dan meminta diskusi setelah ini dan beliau akan meninggalkan email sehingga kita semua bisa mengirim email kepada beliau untuk pertanyaan-pertanyaan tapi beliau menutup dengan membuat resume bahwa ada lima hal penting yang bisa kita lakukan kalau untuk kita ingin menuju kepada inner purification atau perfection dalam spiritual perjalanan menuju Allah pertama adalah dengan mengerti dengan benar apa arti suhud dan melakukannya seperti tadi dikatakan dalam Al-Quran, suhud itu tidak susah karena apa yang kita kehilangan dan tidak senang terhadap apa yang telah kita peroleh. Dan tidak menjadikan material life sebagai satu-satunya kriteria. Yang kedua, lakukanlah hal-hal yang sunnah dan recommended. Dan sangat dipesankan kepada kita semua kalau mampu kita melakukan terus sholat malam. Karena dalam banyak riwayat dari hadis Rasulullah SAW, Dikatakan sholat malam ini sangat besar batilahnya terhadap kita semua. Bab di situlah Allah langsung merespon dan tidak hanya itu, itu banyak riwayat menyatakan sangat dianjurkan. Yang ketiga kita haruslah tidak pernah mau tunduk kepada hawa nafsu kita dan pengaruh ego di dalam diri kita. Kemudian yang keempat ini juga sangat penting. Untuk tidak melupakan orang-orang yang membutuhkan dan orang miskin di masyarakat. Sebab dalam hadis kudsi dikatakan Allah mengatakan bahwa saya mencintai makhlukku dan kalau ada orang-orang yang mencintaiku cintailah orang-orang yang membutuhkan itu. Yang kelima teruslah kecintaan kita kepada ahlu bait sebab mereka ini adalah pembimbing yang paling sempurna dalam ajaran-ajaran yang diribatkan melalui ahlu bait. Wassalam. Demikian. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Silakan diskusi. Kita ada waktu. Tanya jawab paling tidak setengah jam atau lebih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shay. I was just wondering about about the ego. They say number three. You said is uh, you have always overcome your ego. And the thing is, uh, I don't know how far your ego can come. And how do you sort of translate ego as a negative one and positive? Can you just elaborate on that? Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good question. Has, uh, which in Arabic terminology could be defined, or another phrase for it will be na an equal uh, word or phrase in in Arabic uh, to one's ego, the negative, will be the nafs. In a sense, when 
I'll give, I mean, I think uh, the best uh, definition for the negative ego is when everything, all our analysis in the world, once it centers and rests on us, we become the center and the criteria for judging good and bad. If it benefits us, then it's good. If it doesn't, then it becomes bad, irrespective of whether it benefits somebody else or not. This is the negative ego. When Anna or me always becomes the center of everything. In our analysis, personal gain and personal value controls everything. That's the nafs that we try to destroy. We the true Arif is that always, I mean, uh, there is a story about uh, Al-Hafi, the one who always li lived and walked without shoes. One of the Arafa of the third or the fourth century, I think it was the third century, or uh, in Baghdad. He said that I used to have a shop. They asked him why is it that uh, he always walks without slipper. He said, because of one, Alhamdulillah. He said, they said, okay, how can Alhamdulillah become the cause of not wearing slippers? He said, I had a shop in Baghdad one day. Uh, sorry, I had a shop in Baghdad, and one day I was told that the entire market has gone up in flames and caught fire. I came out of the house running towards the market. And I asked whether my shop was okay. I was told, yes, the other shops have been destroyed, but your shop was okay. And I said, Alhamdulillah. For a minute, I suddenly realized that you be, have become so self-centered that you have forgotten about the pain of others and you only care about your own benefit. This kind of attitude is the ego. Otherwise, once we consider ourselves as part of the community and others' pain becomes ours, I, inverted comma, doesn't exist, become we. And that is the difference between the two. So the ego is when we become the center of everything. If there is a drought, as long as it happens in somebody else's house and somebody else's place, it doesn't matter. I don't respond. Not in my house. If there is an earthquake, if others die, as long as don't, I don't die. If somebody else's house is burned, as long as it's somebody else's, it's not mine. If somebody else is killed, as long as it's somebody else's, it's not mine. Everything becomes us. Me, sorry, not us, me. That kind of me is the negative one. That we lose the reality that we are part and parcel of the whole. And this is why I said on the fourth condition, your relationship to the other fellow members. It, we, that is part of your self-development. That you do not consider yourself outside or above everybody else. Once you become the center of everything, then there is a problem. I mean, we see on a number of occasions uh, that, that hadith says you cannot be a true believer if you sleep in your own house soundly with a full stomach while your neighbor is living with an empty stomach. This is the, the effort of through tradition to bring this social responsibility in, where you come out of your own cocoon and you become part and parcel of the whole community. Does that relate for business too? I mean, don't we always think that we have to have a win situation in business? Making profit within a legitimate concept is nothing, uh, there is nothing against it in Sharia. But there is another aspect to it, that when, if you consider your loss and gain from the Almighty Allah, there is a hadith, ammal in, there is a verse in the Holy Quran, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانِ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ If the man, is, Allah tests him through granting of mercy. And then immediately after that ayah says that وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ that means withhold away from some of the blessing. So if we consider wealth as a blessing, taking away as a blessing by Allah. 
then there is nothing to stop you from being profitable. But what you do with the profit after is what matters. <laughs> do you build a wall around yourself and isolate yourself from the rest of the community? As somebody said within this community, uh, I became president recently that I didn't know uh, even poor people existed in our community. Uh, this is the thing that we cannot do. If I may give you one example, a Lebanese origin, I mean, uh, uh, he's head of Remington Shavers in, in America, Victor Kayam, I had an interview some times ago with the BBC t TV, and they asked him uh, if you could uh, tell us a story about your own background. He said, yes, I used to live with my grandfather in Texas, and the bus stop was in the corner of my grandfather's house. Texas is, summer is extremely warm and hot, so I told my grandfather if he can buy me a large pot and I buy Coca-Cola with ice and put it outside and sell it to these passengers who disembark from buses. At the end of the week when my grandfather started calculating, he saw that I have made a loss. He said, well, son, you buy them for three cents, you sell them for five cents. Where is the loss? How did you make a loss here? said, oh, grandfather, I used to see, yes, I used to see a lot of people disembarking from buses have no money, and I simply gave them away for free. He said, son, if you are charitable with your business, you would last long. You wouldn't last long. Be successful with your business, then be charitable with the profit that you've got. That's the difference. Islam doesn't want you to be charitable with your business, make one contribution and that's it, and you become destitute. No. It says be uh, successful in your business, but be charitable with the profit that you get. And once you consider yourself to be part of the community, gladly you will give and contribute. And that's locked. The negative ego disappeared. Dia menyatakan pertanyaan dari ibu itu tentang ego negatif Pembahasan yang lebih luas Jadi dia menyatakan bahwa ego dalam pengertian negatif adalah nafs itu Karena pada poin ketiga dia menganjurkan agar kita tidak melepaskan diri dari uh, atau Tidak jatuh pada dorongan nafs itu atau ego kita Jadi beliau menyatakan bahwa ego negatif itu maksudnya kalau segala sesuatu adalah berpusat pada diri kita Apakah kalau itu sesuatu hal apapun itu menguntungkan, baik menurut kita, kalau tidak itu buruk, nah, kalau sesuatu hal apapun itu judgmentnya berulang pada diri kita, maka itu menjadi ego negatif atau nafs, dan ini tidak tidak dibenarkan dalam Islam, karena baik dan buruk hanya kalau kita yang terkena, dan kita tidak melihat orang lain. Pada abad ketiga hijriah hidup seorang arif, mungkin kita tahu semua, dan dia sering berjalan-jalan di pasar tanpa menggunakan slipper, tanpa menggunakan sepatu. Ketika dia ditanya kenapa demikian, beliau menyatakan bahwa pada suatu hari dia ada orang berteriak bahwa di pasar, pasar itu terbakar. Dan beliau lari-lari dan tanpa menggunakan sandal. Kemudian dia mendapati bahwa seluruh kios terbakar kecuali kiosnya. Dan di situ dikatakan dia bersyukur Alhamdulillah. Dan kemudian dia sadar, karena dia ternyata hanya memikirkan dirinya sendiri karena semua pasar orang lain terbakar. Nah, dengan kesadaran itu dari Allah sehingga dia kemudian berubah pikiran dan merupakan perubahan besar pada dirinya sehingga dia menjadi seorang arif yang besar. Sehingga apapun yang self center itulah menjadi ego negatif. Sehingga kita haruslah merubah I itu menjadi we, saya menjadi kami. Karena kita hidup pada masyarakat muslim. Sehingga kita haruslah tidak mengatakan bahwa Alhamdulillah rumah kita tidak terkena ke bumi dan rumah orang lain hancur. Alhamdulillah kita aman dan di tempat lain musibah. Nah inilah sikap-sikap seperti ini yang kita sering masih mungkin self-center sehingga perlu kita melihat itu. Itu mungkin bisa di suatu negatif. Sehingga beliau mengatakan bahwa poin keempat kita harus melakukan aplikasi yaitu menolong orang yang membutuhkan dan orang-orang miskin. Sehingga di sini kita merasakan sebagai suatu society muslim. Kemudian dilanjutkan dengan pertanyaan, lalu bagaimana tentang dalam masalah bisnis? 
Dia menyatakan bahwa itu boleh saja mendapatkan keuntungan selama itu legitimate dan menyadari bahwa perolehan abu ataupun kehilangan itu adalah dari Allah itu tidak ada masalah sama sekali dan bahkan itu sangat dianjurkan yang menjadi masalah bukanlah profit itu sendiri tetapi penggunaannya nilai kegunaannya kalau kegunaannya positif menurut tuntunan Islam ya itu sangat, sangat bahkan sangat dianjurkan ada suatu tokoh di Libanon yang di Dr. Khayyam itu ketika diwawancara bagaimana biografinya dia menyatakan bahwa suatu saat dia e, di Texas yang melihat orang panasan turun dari bis dan dia ingin menjual kola dengan dia beli 3 sen dan dijual 5 sen tapi kemudian dia rugi karena dia sering memberi dan ini sangat e, dia sebagai contoh bahwa itu tidak tidak benar bahwa kita haruslah sukseful dalam bisnis dalam urusan kita dan kemudian charitable so I'd like to know Who are they? The people who so-called arif but reject the Sharia. There are a number of uh, silsilas at the moment that exist, particularly in the West. When you go to their center of activity, you see all kinds of contradiction. I went to discuss true Irfan with a group of people. I mean, uh, they are well known as Noor Bakhshis in England and America. And I entered the room. I saw the head of the silsila at the Qutb at the moment is sitting in the middle of girls wearing miniskirts, no hijab, nothing. And uh, within a few minutes he made a sound and everybody held hand together and started chanting. And when I inquired as to the meaning of this, they said appearances or superficial values or ibadah and laws obligations as far as we are concerned doesn't exist tariqah has nothing to do with the sharia unfortunately there are a number of silsilas in the west primarily there to justify the western attitude and the western mentality to life that you don't need to change anything even if you come practically naked, they will accept you that yes, you can go towards Allah. That there are there in a num number of them. I don't know whether they exist here or not. I hope not. Ya, pertanyaannya tadi kita dengar. Dia menjelaskan bahwa di barat ini ada cukup banyak tarikat-tarikat yang yang seperti itu. Yang salah satunya dia menyaksikan sendiri pada Nur Bahsi Order. Itu tarikat yang berkembang juga di England dan di Amerika atau di Eropa di mana mereka mengaku sebagai kelompok tarikat dan dalam pada satu pertemuan beliau hadir untuk berdiskusi dengan mereka beliau melihat bahwa ibu-ibu atau wanita yang hadir di situ pun menggunakan mini skirt dan tidak menggunakan hijab jadi itu penuh kontradiksi bahwa mereka sebagai pejalan rohani menuju Allah tetapi berbeda dengan apa yang penampilan ataupun yang dilakukannya tidak lama kemudian sang master ini melakukan biasanya demikian dalam tarikat-tarikat mereka menggunakan sikir bersana atau chatting dan chanting dan mulai ekstase begitu dan mereka ini berpegangan tangan satu sama lain dan tidak peduli lagi pria dan wanita nah dia melihat bahwa hal, -hal seperti ini suwi-suwi order seperti ini yang menganggap bahwa syariah itu tidak ada gunanya jadi bagi mereka tarikat saja menurut mereka penting hal-hal seperti itu tidak berhubungan dan ini sangat berbeda dengan yang diajarkan dari Ahlul Bait dan beliau berharap di Indonesia itu tidak ada hal seperti itu. Nur Baksi. Nur Baksi ya. Yeah, that's one of them. Nur Baksi, salah satunya. Dan mungkin banyak lagi sebenarnya. These are, uh, in every society you may come across few of them, particularly those who are living under secular mentality. That to attract people rather than force them to change their way of life, they would look for an excuse to justify whatever they have. Women do not need, men or women do not need to offer prayers. Fasting is not necessary. Uh, hijab and code of dress is not important. You can be anything. Uh, just be present in Khanaqa or in particular place and chant once a week with the worship. That's it. That's enough. Beliau menambahkan bahwa hal seperti itu sering terjadi pada masyarakat sekuler yang mana mereka para sufi master ini tidak mengajak berubah karena mereka berharap orang masuk tanpa melakukan perubahan-perubahan itu sehingga mereka merasa tidak perlu mengeluarkan hijab ataupun hal-hal lain cukup mereka apapun dan mereka mengatakan ini adalah grup untuk menuju Allah ketika beliau datang ke Tazkiyah kemarin beliau melihat gambar itu 
ketika dia bertanya dia mengatakan ini apa sekelompok mukminat yang sensor dan apa menyukai Irfan dia sangat kagum karena dia melihat kalau di tempat lain itu yang suka begitu biasanya pakaiannya tidak karuan dan lain-lain sehingga dia menyatakan bahwa mungkin ini ini kita ini kalau <laughs> itu betul <laughs> jadi artinya apa di tempat lain itu tidak menggunakan hijab begitu sedangkan di situ kan tertib tertutup What is it that if I go to other society like this, that there are some Ustad, very, very clever ones, brilliant ones, that I told them, I asked them about the history about Islam, and when we come to a point of Karbala and things like that, they want to elaborate on that. And I said, uh, why? And they said, if you are already in the middle of the fight between the Sunni and the Shia, then you are in trouble. So I thought, uh, what do you mean by the fight? You, you, you just don't be involved in them, just be out of it. So I said, I don't want to be out of it, I want to know the truth. I said, uh, what is it with the Sunni? What is it with the Shia? I'm about to fight. Because according to me, blah, 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 with all the uh, history, and I explained to them, and of course he knows better than me, and he just doesn't want to give in. What is it? Is it the ego again? Or what? That's where you came in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> See, it's, sister, it's very difficult for somebody, particularly after spending 20 years, 30 years in education, and considering themselves to be highest, the highest beacon of light in society, to admit that everything that I have done has been wrong. <laughs> It really requires a man or a, a great woman that uh, make a decision at the end of going through analysis that this is the right path and I have to change. One of the problems that we have always had when it comes to discussion and debate with the, the majority of scholars is that when they enter debate, as soon as they find out that they are painting themselves into a corner, they are not prepared to go any further. They break the discussion and that's it. Because they know if they were to develop this any further, impartially, The only alternative out of it would be for them to say, yes, we admit that you, we were wrong. And this is something that they are not prepared to do, which is primarily evil. Uh, a friend of mine told me a story. It was, say, 60, 70 or 80 years ago when mode of transportation was not that like today. Within half an hour, an hour or two hours, you can travel from one place to another. Uh, it used to be a custom that every time scholars from the Ahlul Bayt school of thought went into Saudi Arabia, they had a debate with the scholars from the followers of the other four schools of thought. And this was uh, recently within a Wahhabi, up to even 20-30 years ago, it was normal. But when the, the, their scholars were not prepared to come forward and debate, then it, people forgot about it. One Ustad in Iran said that, Marhum uh, Ashtiani, he said, my father told me this story that I went to Hajj and I had a discussion with the Mufti of Mecca with regard to Ahlul Bayt and the, their righteousness and the true uh, method of following them. After the debate he kept quiet and he said, can I invite you to my house this evening? So I went to his house. He took me upstairs to the library and he said, uh, Ustad, if you bring me 40 hadith about the righteousness of Ahlul Bayt, I will bring 400 hadith for your support. But if I admit that Ahlul Bayt is right, I cannot be Mufti of Mecca anymore. That shows the position. But it's not that easy for one to step on one's ego, as you put it, on nafs, and say, look, I have made a mistake, and I'm prepared to pay the price. Even if it means I live as a poor person, it's better for me to live as a poor person, but following the just path, than be as a rich man, but following the unjust path. It's not easy for people like myself, who are still at the bottom, struggling with, with the nafs to make a decision. And that has a role to play. As soon as you tell them, no, 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 it's, it becomes a taboo. Don't touch it. Why? Because they are worried about the, that, that can of worm. If you opened it, 
where are they going to stop? One question is lead to, leads to another, to another, and to another. Before they know it, they have nothing apart from dogma. And that's a worrying point. I give you an example before Brother Hadi continues with the translation. Uh, I mean, I have known Brother Hadi from, from London. I used to go to his university for lectures, and there were other universities that used to invite me. Southampton University, once they invited me that we have a problem with the Wahhabis and the Salafis here. And they call the followers of Ahlul Bayt Mushrikeen. Yes, Mushrikeen and Kuffar. Mushrikeen and Kuffar. And uh, every time we want to do something, they hold banners and placards. We don't want Mushrikeen here, we don't want Kuffar here. Can you come and deliver a lecture? I said, okay. So I uh, took all the books that I could find out with me, and I left deliberately the books outside, open in the number of pages ready. And I asked a friend of mine, don't bring them in until I give an indication. And I came and sat down, the front row became full of the Salafi movement. They all came sat in the front. And I said, look, I want to approach this with one condition. That up to now, I have been brought up as the followers of Ahlul Bayt. I would not claim that it is right or wrong. But I would like to say here, I make a declaration, that if you prove me wrong, I stand up and say from tomorrow, whatever madam you tell me, I'll follow. I would like you to approach it with the same commitment, that if I prove you wrong, you stand up and you say whatever I say. They walked out. They were not prepared to set a debate and discussion with this kind of mentality. And this is the problem that we face constantly. In Canada, I started the first Jum'ah prayer in Carlton University. We came to an agreement with the, most of the, uh, the Al Jama'ah uh, community that one week they will send an Imam and one week the, imam, the followers of Ahlul Bayt will send an, send an Imam. They agreed. It was when the Salafis and the Wahhabis got in, when it was my turn to go there, it was the, the history bill made in, in Carlton University, the first uh, followers of Ahlul Bayt Imam that goes there to deliver a sermon. What happened? Uh, the cultural attaché of the Saudi embassy was standing there with a group of Salafi holding placard. We don't want kuffars here. And every time I tried to ask them to say, okay, what is the definition of mushrik according to Islam? What is the definition of kuffar according to Islam? If I say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, still you consider me a kafir or mushrik? They were not prepared even to discuss it. As far as they are concerned, we are mushrikeens. They will deal with the Yahud and the Jews, but they will not deal with me. And that's the pain. This is why I said, this is the negative ego. When it blinds you, you don't see reality anymore. There is a verse in, in the Holy Quran, it says, Istahwada alayhimu shaytan fa'ansahum dhikrallah. That shaytan has engulfed them like a mold. It's like a mold has engulfed them. They can't see anything. They get to the stage where even we have Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahya al Munkar. They do Amr bil Munkar and Nahya al Ma'roof. And they still consider that Ma'roof and Munkar. The whole reality changes, turns upside down. And when you see this, you try to provide them with facts and figures from their own book. Not from ours. From their own book, they are not prepared to listen. What they say? This print is published by Shias, we don't trust them. It's Sahih Bukhari, published in Lebanon by a Sunni uh, group of publishers. No, no, no. Because there is a hadith in it, it must be Shia print. Pertanyaannya, bagaimana kadang-kadang kita hadir pada pengajian atau majelis lain dan ketika kita mulai bertanya tentang sejarah Islam, histori Karbala dan lain-lain, selalu dikatakan bahwa ini masuk pada area pertentangan atas judi syiah. Dan kalau kita masuk itu, kita akan repot dan banyak ustadz yang tidak mau jawab. Apakah ini termasuk ego? Kemudian belum menjelaskan, ya ini termasuk salah satu negatif ego, di mana kadang-kadang para ustadz atau orang yang terpelajar lama ini tidak siap menerima kenyataan. Bahwa mereka setelah 20 tahun lama belajar, kemudian... Tidak siap menerima kenyataan bahwa apa yang mereka percayai, apa yang mereka pelajari ternyata mengandung kekeliruan. Dan ini memerlukan suatu upaya yang besar dari kita untuk mengatasi atau menyatakan bahwa apa yang kita percaya itu salah atau keliru. Gitu. Ada suatu cerita menarik yang beliau sampaikan tentang pengalaman ayah dari Syekh Astiani 
ketika beliau haji di Mekah di masa lalu diskusi antara ulama dari berbagai masa itu sering terjadi pada haji di Mekah Madinah suatu saat seorang ulama baik berkunjung kepada mufti Madinah dan berdiskusi tentang itu kemudian setelah diskusi malamnya beliau diundang untuk makan malam dan diajak ke personal library-nya dan di sana dilihatkan banyak sekali kitab-kitab dari kaum muslimin ulama mufti Madinah ini menyatakan bahwa kalau anda katakan 40 hadis untuk mensupport Ahlul Bait saya akan membawakan 400 hadis jadi dia bisa menunjukkan banyak sekali tapi kalau saya diminta untuk mengikuti Ahlul Bait saya akan kehilangan posisi saya menjadi mufti Madinah jadi itu menunjukkan bahwa tidak mudah bahkan bagi ulama sekalipun untuk mengalahkan egonya apalagi kita kemudian yang kedua dia menyatakan di Southampton dimana terjadi bahwa kesulitan beliau ketika berdakwah di University of Southampton di London di England bahwa sangat orang-orang Wahabi ya biasanya sebenarnya dengan Ahlus Sunnah tidak masalah tapi dengan Wahabi kadang dan tidak seluruh Wahabi kadang-kadang mereka sangat ekstrem dan tidak mau mendengar ataupun melarang menganggap kita musyrik dan kufar kemudian beliau menyatakan menawarkan kepada mereka kalau anda buktikan bahwa apa yang anda pikirkan betul saya akan mengikuti anda dari besok tapi kalau saya nyatakan saya benar Anda bersedia tidak ikut apa yang saya katakan Dan mereka tidak siap dan keluar dan Itu menunjukkan juga bahwa Seringkali para Ulama juga ataupun orang terbelajar Ini tidak siap juga menerima keadaan Sehingga Itu terjadi juga di Ruthi Carlton di Kanada Ketika beliau sering memberikan khutbah Gantian antara Ahlul Bait dan Ahlul Sunnah Menggunakan masjid Kemudian tiba-tiba menjadi kacau karena pengaruh Atas Saudi di situ Yang melarang dan mereka selalu Tidak mampu menjelaskan definisi kufar dan musyrik yang benar sehingga ini adalah hal-hal yang merupakan negatif ego yang sangat tidak mudah untuk diatasi kecuali dengan kemauan yang keras I agree in one sense that I believe most of what gives me istiqama and uh, patience and determination is the upbringing and this is why I say your role is so important not only in your de- your own development in the future development of the next generation fathers this is why we have so many tradition in respect of mothers not in respect of fathers they say that heaven is made under the feet of mothers not fathers there is nothing about fathers uh, somebody went to the holy prophet and asked in my life whom should i respect He said your mother again your mother again your mother again your mother again your father so four times emphasis on the role of motherhood and the importance that they have in the character building of the next generation than a father because of their association with the child i agree it's very difficult don't think that anybody else who has let go, who has gone there and managed to survive a little bit they have not had to go through difficult time and difficult decision your istiqama again comes from the almighty allah if you really sincerely pray in true arfan we have to understand that we have nothing we have no power we have nothing comes from ourselves it's only his mercy even if we are able to resist temptation through the prayer and asking him otherwise with a number of temptations that you get around it will be difficult to rely on your own self and your own purification or your own steps that you have gone through in your life uh, to somehow save you it's very difficult instantaneously one could just disappear uh, and shay- knowing that shaitan comes from left right and center as the verse said i will come from the top from bottom from right from left from the front from the back until so in in your life if your primary and the first step in your life is based on his mercy and his power and ask him to provide you with the environment and that you protect yourself it's possible but i agree it's not going to be easy it's constant struggle even between jihad al-akbar and jihad al-asghar 
uh, where the Holy Prophet tells those who came back from the fight that marhaban be those that came back from jihad al-asghar, the, the minor jihad, but the greater jihad is still within you. Jihad means struggle, endeavor, work. And this never stops. If every time I go out and I see something, yes, the nafs wants it. But I close my eyes for the sake of Allah and be humble and put my head down. I want to buy something I wanted, but it's going to go against the will of Allah. Make the struggle to force myself not to accept it. It becomes easy and becomes a habit. Initially, it's very difficult. My ears would like to listen to something which is not permitted. My probably what we call dust side and the earth side would enjoy this music but goes against the command of Allah for this for his sake everything that we do is for his sake and uh, there are a number of traditions that says uh, when you wake up in the morning the first thing that you ask Allah to give you power to resist temptation if you think those who have been able to survive, it's from their own side, I don't think it's possible. The temptation is too much. It's constant prayer, constant asking Allah, constant supplications that we, we have managed to survive this little bit of faith that has left. Pertanyaan dari Ibu Yanti adalah bagaimana kita istiqomah Ini pertanyaan yang sangat bagus dan memang sangat sulit bagi kita semua terutama saya yang masih muda Mungkin tidak bagi Ibu sekalian Jadi beliau menyatakan bahwa istiqomah memang yang beliau alami oleh Syekh Hasyurid ini Sangat dipengaruhi juga oleh masa kecilnya di keluarga Jadi sehingga beliau melihat bahwa peranan Ibu ini demikian pentingnya untuk upbringing apa children sehingga di situ akan sangat menentukan masa depannya sehingga pendidikan yang benar di masa kecil itu sangat mempengaruhi karakter yang akan terbentuk 50 tahun kemudian 30 tahun kemudian sehingga ini penting peranan wanita atau ibu di dalam rumah tangga itu dan dia menyatakan bahwa tidak ada yang tidak menghadapi kesulitan dan memang sangat sulit untuk bisa istiqomah sehingga advis pertamanya beliau adalah Sungguh-sungguh selalu memohon kepada Allah Karena kekuatan itu hanya datangnya dari Allah Kita kalau betul sungguh-sungguh maka Allah pasti akan berikan pertolongan Yang kedua adalah kita harus menyadari bahwa tidak ada kekuatan atau apapun itu kecuali dari Allah Dan kita menyadari semua itu hanyalah rahmat dari Allah Sehingga dengan demikian kita menyerahkan semuanya kepada Allah Dan terus struggle terhadap uh, segala macam cobaan kita harus melakukan semuanya termasuk misalnya kita menutup mata kita dari hal-hal yang tidak apa yang yang apa yang membuat kita ingin kemudian telinga dan hal lain misalnya hanya untuk Allah ya for the sake of Allah sehingga inilah struggle yang dinyatakan dalam hadis sebagai jihad al akbar jihad yang besar yang terus konstan dan tidak pernah berhenti. Nah, beberapa tips juga yang kita dapati dari Aimah Halul Bait adalah dengan konstan membaca doa Doa-doa yang diriwayatkan Dan ada advice bahwa setiap pagi ketika kita bangun pagi Kita diminta untuk memohon pertolongan dari Allah untuk mampu melawan segala macam pengaruh nafs itu Begian. Thank you very much, sisters Oh, juga tentang musik so he asked you about music. Uh, well, it's an issue that I can't go into it now. <laughs> Inshallah, next time. I'll write my email here. If you want, then I can deal it through email. Yeah, dia mengatakan ada beberapa musik, tapi kalau yang sepanjang saya tidak seluruh musik. Seperti fatwa para mustahid adalah musik-musik yang diputar di diskotik. Itu tidak tidak dianjurkan. Tapi musik yang klasik masih diperbolehkan ya. dan musik lain yang tidak membuat kita ini dari Iran dari Iran tapi lama di Iran. It was my pleasure meeting the sisters here. It's, when I, it's an experience that I hope uh, in future, inshallah, by the grace of Allah, I will be able uh, to meet them again and repeat. Thank you very much for listening. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi Suatu kehormatan bagi beliau atas undangan ini dan berharap bisa bertemu di kemudian hari. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. اللهم إني أسألك من نبيك المرسل وبأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين أن لا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا إلهي 
أجل في فرج مولانا صاحب الزمان اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد واجعل عواقب أمورنا خيرا ربنا لا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا واجعل عواقب أمورنا خيرا اللهم احفظنا في الدين أحفظ ديننا واحفظ دنيانا واجعل المشركين والمعاندين هم الأسفلين اللهم احفظ جميع علماء الإسلام واحفظنا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله